Our text this morning is John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. The title of our sermon, The Good Shepherd's Love for His Sheep. We're in part two as we were working through this text and working through John chapter 10. It is a glorious text, just an astounding passage of scripture. And here in John chapter 1 through 10, uh, John chapter 10 verses 1 through 10, we're just getting into the, the initial part of this text of scripture and all the theology and all the, the truth that God is communicating here. It really is just an astounding, astounding section of scripture. It's all astounding. It's all good. But here's just a beautiful text. Uh, God's own picture, God's own depiction of what it looks like to be under the sovereign love and care of the good shepherd. Such profound theology, such profound truths here. Uh, the sovereignty of God, the responsibility of man, uh, the depravity of man, the uh, effectual call of God, the irresistible grace, uh, just so much theology packed in here. So it's our joy to be able to continue studying this this morning. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, is the good shepherd who gives his life in love for the sheep. This is a picture of the good shepherd's love for his sheep. Now that love of the good shepherd for his sheep, we began last week seeing in four ways displayed. In verses 1 and 2, he shepherds his people with a protective love. That love is a protective love. In verses 3 through 4, he shepherds his people with a directive love or an authoritative love. In verses 5 through 8, he shepherds them with an exclusive love, an exclusive love. And in verses 9 through 10, he shepherds his people with an exhaustive love. So as we Got into verses 1 and 2 last week. We looked at he shepherds his people with a protective love. Where the Bible reads in verse 1, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now this protective love initially displayed here in verse 1 with a stern warning. Most assuredly, amen, amen, listen carefully to me, this is emphatic, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, the reason this begins with a protective love is because sheep are perpetually in danger. They're perpetually in danger. Notice first from verse 1 that in the shepherd's protective love, he gives the warning, and then we see that the flock of God is enclosed in the sheepfold. And again, the sheepfold intended to keep the sheep in and danger out. There was often a high wall for protection, uh, often as much as 10 or 12 feet high, and a paid doorkeeper that sat at a single gate, a single entrance. There was only one legitimate way in or out of the sheepfold. It was through a single door. Now to picture this protecting love for the sheep, we saw that the Lord begins with a contrast. He begins by contrasting the thieves and robbers that climb up some other way in verse 1 with the good shepherd that enters in by the door in verse 2. Now all of this on the heels of how the, the religious thieves and robbers of the day had just treated the man born blind in John chapter 9. Those thieves and robbers treated him miserably. So, the thieves and robbers, primarily representative of the false religious leaders of the Lord's day, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious elite, those that we've seen so far in opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the thieves and robbers. By contrast, the good shepherd, the one who enters in at the door, and in verse 11, he is the one who gives his life for the sheep. He is the only one who enters in by the door and gives his life for the sheep. He's not coming in unlawfully. He's not coming in over the wall. He's not sneaking in some other way like a thief or a robber. He enters in at the lawful door. And so last week we saw the good shepherd's love for his sheep in his protection. It is a protective love. Today, beginning in verse 3, I want you to see that he shepherds his people here with a directive love or an authoritative love. And let's unpack this beginning in verse 3. To him, 
Verse 3 reads, The doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Now in verse 3, the doorkeeper opens to the one who has the authority, I want you to see that, to direct the sheep. The doorkeeper opens to the one who has authority to lead and to direct the sheep. We know from verse 5, if you look at verse 5, that the sheep will not follow a stranger. And we know that the doorkeeper will not open to thieves and robbers. They're having to sneak in some other way. The doorkeeper opens only to him who calls the sheep, leads the sheep, brings out the sheep, and goes before the sheep. The sheep follow him, and he is the one whom the sheep know. They know his voice. Now notice the emphasis here in verse 3. Listen, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Now, if you read through verses 3 and 4 that way, the emphasis you can see is all on the sheep. No, it's not. It's not on the sheep. It's on him, right? All the emphasis here is on what he, who's that? The good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. The emphasis is on what he does. Now listen, he calls them. He leads them. He brings them out. He goes before them. In verse 11, he dies for them. Now look at the text. What do the sheep do? In verse 3, they hear. All right? As a fruit of that hearing, in verse 4, they follow and in verse 5, they flee from strangers. Got to put this in perspective. The he, the him, the his, in verses 3 and 4, all refer to the shepherd of the sheep in verse 2. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. As we come to verse 3 now, the doorkeeper only opens to him, the good shepherd who has the authority to direct and to lead his sheep. This is an authoritative love, a directive love. Now think about this for a moment. And think about the goodness of the good shepherd. Why would you want to be led by anyone else? Is there anyone else that you can imagine being directed by? Are you going to be directed by your own flesh? You want to direct yourself? It's like a, you know, abandoning a baby to live for themselves as that baby sees fit. It's like a completely foolish thing to do, right? It's gonna, the baby's going to die. Why would you want to be led by anyone else? Why would you submit yourself to the authority of self, sovereign self, right? Why would you submit to the authority of anyone else in that way? The Lord Jesus Christ is a loving, good shepherd, and he has the authority to lead his sheep, submit to him. When you submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, all works out for your good. Incidentally here, as we look at this text, who then is the doorkeeper? Who's the doorkeeper? You know, in one sense, this is not an allegory. It's not an allegory where you look at each piece of the account, each piece of the story, and you look for deeper connections or deeper meanings behind every character or meaning behind every detail. If you look at verse 6 here, Jesus simply calls it an illustration, a paroimia, a paroimia. He's using a simple and well-known comparison, the sheep and the shepherd, and he's using this picture to call out the difference between himself and the false shepherds. Now, however, as we think about our context here, the Lord is giving us the backstory. We understand who the good shepherd is, right? We understand thieves and robbers referring to the false religious leaders of the day, false shepherds of the day. We understand the sheep, don't we, to be God's elect. And we're going to see that more clearly as we work through this passage. There's a meaning associated here with the sheepfold. We're going to talk about that more as well. Jesus, in verse 7, identifies himself with the very door of the sheep. And here in verse 3, we're introduced to this bit of an enigma here, the doorkeeper. The doorkeeper. Now, I was meditating on this for a while the last couple of weeks, thinking about the doorkeeper. 
You have to ask the question, what exactly does a doorkeeper do? What does a doorkeeper do? A doorkeeper guards against unauthorized entry, right? And he allows authorized entry. A doorkeeper is a guard of sorts, not allowing those unauthorized to enter, but then allowing those authorized to enter. Now you could say, and many have, that the only one that could do that for the Lord Jesus Christ, here is the good shepherd, would be God himself. And we wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, we wouldn't dispute that. That's certainly true. But I think in thinking about the doorkeeper, we can be more specific. Think for a moment about the redemptive plan of God. What must be involved for sinful man to have access and right standing with a holy God? What must be involved? One, one must perfectly fulfill the just and righteous demands of God's holy law. Therefore, the law of God stands as a doorkeeper, if you will, to access to God. In order for sinful man to have access and right standing with a holy God, one must fully satisfy and propitiate the just wrath of God against sin. Therefore, the righteous judgment of God stands as doorkeeper. One must be perfect to enter, as our Heavenly Father is perfect, the Lord says. And therefore, the holiness of God stands as doorkeeper. One must fulfill and purchase the eternal decrees, the eternal covenants, the eternal promises of God. That God in himself might be both just and the justifier. Therefore, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed by an oath, stands as doorkeeper. One must be fully man, in all ways as we are, yet without sin. He must be fully God, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, the Son of God perfected forever. Therefore, now think about it, the mediatory requirements of a new and better covenant stand as doorkeeper. You see, if you, if you look at the doorkeeper in this way, there is only one, there is only one who is able to enter the most holy place past the doorkeeper of God's demands and decrees. Not by the shedding of, bloods, and shedding of blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood shed once for all, having obtained eternal redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ entered. Jesus Christ alone entered. Now why is that important? Because we ourselves, you and I, can only enter past the doorkeeper if we are in him. Only through union with the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Romans chapter 15 verse 12. In him the Gentiles shall hope. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, listen to this. He chose us, God chose us in him. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him, Paul says, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. 
in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. There's only one. There's only one to whom the doorkeeper opens. There is only one. There's only one who is worthy to receive entry. Do you see? In Revelation chapter 5, as John wept, there's only one, only one who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, John says, was able to open the scroll. Only one. The Lord Jesus Christ alone is worthy. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other religious leader is worthy. You are not worthy. I'm not worthy. If we are to be with him, then we must be in him. Do you see? Al Mohler said this. If all we need is a teacher of enlightenment, then Buddha will do. If all we need is a collection of gods for every occasion and need and hope, then Hinduism will do. If all we need is a tribal deity, then any tribal deity will do. If all we need is a lawgiver then Moses will do. If all we need is a set of rules and a way of devotion, then Muhammad or Joseph Smith will do. If all we need is inspiration and insight into the sovereign self for crying out loud, Oprah will do. But if we need a savior, then only the Lord Jesus Christ will do. Only one blood that can make us white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing can for sin atone. Certainly nothing good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So what happens to those who are not in him? They're not in the only one to whom the doorkeeper opens. You see how all of those demands and decrees of God's holiness and God's character and God's covenants and God's promises stand as keys that only the Lord Jesus Christ can open? He's the only one that can fulfill all of the promises of God. He's the only one in perfect accord with the righteousness and holiness of God. It is only in him that we can have any fellowship with God. But listen, in him, you can come boldly to the throne room of grace. If you're not in him, then you do not enter. Those that are not in him, they perish in hell. Those that are not in him are separated from him for all eternity. To die under the curse of God, the condemnation of God, the judgment of God, the torment of God, the wrath of God, the eternal punishment of God. Why is that? It's because they refuse to come to Christ alone. Christ alone is sufficient. Would you add works to that? Would you add any supposed righteousness that you think you have? Can you add anything to that? Nothing to that. Christ alone is sufficient. Turn to him from your sin. They refuse. Those that do not enter in refuse to count all things lost to gain Christ. To gain Christ and to be found in him. Will you trust him? He's the one that opens the door. He is the door. He is the one to whom the doorkeeper opens to the glorious blessings and riches of God. Will you trust him today and turn from your sin? Do that now. Do it now. Your delay in light of that Glory is grievous sin. Turn to Christ. As the doorkeeper opens to him, as the doorkeeper opens, John says in chapter 10, verse 3, he says the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. If you remember the Great Commission, the Lord Jesus Christ, before he ascended to heaven, said that all authority has been given to him alone. In heaven and on earth, 
He is the only one worthy, in whom all the demands and decrees of God are fulfilled. He calls his own sheep here. He leads them out. He goes before them, and they follow him. Do you see? I want you to see that the good shepherd's love for his sheep is a directive love. It is an authoritative love. And I want you to see this from our text in two ways. First, his directive or authoritative love is seen in his calling and leading of the sheep. His directive or authoritative love is seen in the calling and leading of the good shepherd in verse 3. Secondly, his directive or authoritative love is seen in the following and in the knowing of the sheep. On one side, you see it in the leading, the calling and the leading of the good shepherd. On the other side, you see it in the following and in the knowing of the sheep. First, his directive love is seen in the calling and in the leading of the shepherd. Verse 3, the second half there, he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. Now, if you picture the scene, having stayed all night in the village sheepfold, under the guard of the doorkeeper, the sheep, first thing in the morning, would hear the call of the good shepherd. The shepherd would come. The doorkeeper would allow the shepherd in, and he would call out to the sheep of his flock to gather them to him and to take them out to pasture. Now, ancient Near East shepherds, you look at this, there's a lot of material on it. They were known to have particular calls or particular whistles for the sheep. They would have been distinctive to the sheep. The sheep would have recognized those distinctive calls and come to the shepherd. So hearing the shepherd's voice, they would recognize his particular call to them, and those specific sheep, those that were his, would separate themselves from the rest of the flock in the sheepfold, and they would come to him. The shepherd, when he had all of his own sheep together, he would lead them off to pasture. Now this is just such a beautiful picture of God's calling and God's care for his people. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We can make several observations then here about the nature of his calling and leading from our text. First, regarding those sheep which he calls and leads, regarding those sheep which he calls and leads, notice First, that they are his own sheep. They're his own sheep. He owns them. If you're in Christ through repentant faith, turning from sin and trusting him, then you are a blood-bought, purchased possession of the Good Shepherd. Your specific redemption purchased by his particular atonement at the cross. Now think about this, being his own and having purchased you with his own blood, he has the right and the authority to both call you and lead you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, Paul says, for you were bought at a price. That comes with an implication, he says. You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. His is an authoritative love. Now, with this authoritative love, the good shepherd will, without fail, lead you to eternal rest. Drop down to chapter 10 and look at verses 28 and 29. Chapter 10, look at verse 28. The good shepherd says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Now, why is that? Is that because the sheep are so faithful in following? No, right? That's the power of the good shepherd. That's the love of the good shepherd. That's the constraining and compelling and irresistible and effectual, efficacious grace of the good shepherd that they never are snatched out of his hand. They never perish. Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. 
as we consider this, if he's in the sheepfold and he's calling sheep, his sheep to himself, then this also presupposes that there are other sheep in the fold that are not his own. Now, this is an important point to understand. He goes to the fold, and out of the fold he calls his own. Okay, now here specifically, in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, the Lord is referring to Israel. He's referring to Judaism. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of of Israel. Now he's first sent to that fold, if you will, to Judaism, to Israel. Now that doesn't mean here that God rejects the Gentiles. If you drop down to chapter 10, verse 16, we're going to get here. Look at what he says in verse 16. He says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, and them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. We're going to get there and talk about that. Israel was intended to mediate salvation to the Gentiles. And we're going to work through that as we get to verse 16. Now think through this for a moment. Out of this fold, referenced here in verses 1 through 6, the fold of Israel, the fold of Judaism, out of that fold, he calls those who are his own. Now all those, according to verse 29, are all those that the Father has given to him. Now you might say for, for a moment, Wait a minute. I thought that the Jewish people were all children of God. I thought that Israel were all children of God. No. John chapter 1, verse 11. You remember our text, don't you? John says, he came to his own. Who's that? The children of Israel, the Jews. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. His own did not receive him. Now, the Jews professed to be people of God. They profess to be the children of God. But listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Paul says, Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. What do you mean by that, Paul? <laughs> chapter 11, verse 5. At the present time, there is a remnant, a part or a portion of them that are chosen by grace. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. There is a remnant, there's a part or a portion of them chosen or elected by grace. Chapter 11, verse 7, Paul says, Israel, the nation of Israel, has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. Putting it another way, Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, Paul says, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now this is really important to understand. God is making a division among those who profess to be his. We'll see this more clearly as we work through John chapter 10. God makes a division among those who profess to be his. God's people, those people, those sheep that he purchased at the cross, those that are truly his, are not those who merely profess to be his or merely identify with his people. God's people, those he purchased, those he bought with his own blood, at the cross, those that are truly his are not those who merely profess to be his or merely identify themselves with his people, either through ethnicity, like the Jews do here. They would profess to be children of Abraham. So we're God's people, children of God, certainly going to heaven. And today we see it most prominently in those who make a profession of faith. Jesus says in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But who is it who enters? Who is it who enters? Those who do the will of my Father in heaven. As we looked at John, or Romans chapter 2, those who are truly his, those who are truly in him are those marked by a circumcised heart. He's not a Jew who is one outwardly 
nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter. A humble and contrite heart. A heart that is broken and mourning over sin. A heart that's been changed by God. A transformed heart. And those who bear the fruit of truly hearing. Those who bear the fruit of truly hearing. I want you to see, those, they are those who follow and obey the Good Shepherd. So listen, whether it's out of the sheepfold of first century Judaism, whether it's out of the fold of ethnicity, descendancy in Abraham, or my dad was a pastor, or I grew up in church, or whatever it is, whether it's out of the fold of first century Judaism, or it's out of the 21st century fold of easy believism, Catholicism, Dead, lifeless orthodoxy, word of faith, Mormonism, the damning plague of so-called nominal Christianity today. Whatever fold you're in, if he calls you, then he causes you to be born again and he changes you. Circumcision is not outward, it is inward and of the heart. Your life will never be the same. Next, regarding the sheep, I want you to see this. Regarding those sheep which he calls and leads, notice that he calls them out by name. He calls them out by name. If you're here today and you're a Christian, why are you a Christian? <laughs> Think about why you're a Christian. You point back to a work that you did, a decision that you made, an aisle that you walked, a prayer that you prayed, a sacrament that you took, a baptism that you went to. You're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian because the Lord of glory, the great shepherd of the sheepfold, he foreknew you and he predestined you. And then he effectually called you here by name. Now that by name means that he called you individually. It wasn't calling this mass of humanity. He called you and he called you by name. He called you personally. He called you individually. And it was a special call. An intimate call, do you see? You're not just a number to God. You're not just a number to God. He calls his sheep by name. Fluffy, <laughs> right? Cotton, you know, Frank, all right? He calls you by name. Now, when you think about that for a moment, the calling of his own by name presupposes that the sheep were his before he called them. Do you see? This is where all this theology comes together. If you're going to be precise in your theology, precise with the Word of God, faithful to the text of Scripture, then all this has to fit together, and it does beautifully because it's God's Word. The calling of His own presupposes that these sheep were His before He called them. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says this, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined these to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, now listen, whom he predestined, these he also called. Those whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. This call, this calling of God is often referred to as the effectual call or an efficacious call because it works. It accomplishes the purpose for which God intends it. It accomplishes what it intends to accomplish. And notice the chain in Romans 8, 28 and following. It's unbroken. Those whom he predestined, he called them. Those that he called, those are the ones that he justified, and those that he justifies, they are glorified. So you could put it all together and say, those whom he predestined, he glorifies, and everything in the middle. <laughs> it's an unbroken chain. It is an irresistible grace. His plans, his decrees are unthwarted. They cannot fail. If you are in Christ, then you were called from death to life. You were called from sin. You were called by name from rebellion against God into sonship 
with him by the very Savior that God sent into the world to secure your calling, to secure your redemption. Then having been called, having been called, you are justified. Having been justified, you will be glorified. If you notice from Romans chapter 8, he speaks of that glorification as in the past. It's so certain, so set in the eternal decrees of God, it is as if it's already taken place. You will be glorified. Now, how do you know? How do you know that you've been called? We're talking about these sheep that he calls and he leads. He calls them out by name. How do you know that you've been called? Now, according to verse 29, if you drop down to chapter 10, verse 29, these that he calls are a particular flock of sheep, and they're a particular flock of sheep that God the Father gives to him. Verse 29 says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. One of the marks or evidences that this flock, these sheep, belong to him, a particular mark of elect sheep that have been effectually called by God is the fact that his own sheep hear his voice. Verse 3. They hear his voice. They know his voice. In verse 4. They know his voice. And they follow him. That's important to note. Just like Matthew, the tax collector, right? He got up from his tax table and he followed Christ. He called Philip. He called Nathaniel. He called Simon Peter. Simon Peter left his nets, left his fishing, and followed Christ. You, you may have lived long in your rebellion. You may have been stiff-necked. You may have rejected Christ at every turn. Even now here today, you may be sitting here rejecting the preaching of God's word, rejecting God's grace to you that you're here, rejecting the Lord of glory who gives his life for the sheep. You may be stiff-necked, hard-hearted, rebellious, loving your sin, intending fully to go back to it. But when the grace of God in his love toward you appears, you turn and follow him. It is an efficacious, effectual grace. The sheep that are his, those that hear his voice, they know his voice, they follow him. And you are stiff-necked no longer, amen? If you're in, if you're in Christ, praise God. You can't take credit for that yourself, right? There's no sense in which we can own our own righteousness now that we say we've professed the Lord. It's all in Him. It's God's work. God turns you from sin to Himself, turns you from rebellion to righteousness. It's a beautiful hymn by Isaac Watts. While all our hearts and all our songs Join to admire the feast, right? The wedding supper of the Lamb. Each of us cry with thankful tongues, Lord, why was I a guest? Have you ever asked that question? It's common to Christians. Lord, why? Why would you have saved me? Look at how wretched, how undeserving. Why was I made? Notice the passive voice there. Why was I made, the hymn says, to hear thy voice? That's good biblical theology. Why was I made to hear thy voice and enter while there's room? When thousands make a wretched choice and rather starve than come. T'was that same love that spread the feast that sweetly drew us in. Else we had still refused to taste and perished in our sin. It's all of the good shepherd and the good shepherd's love for his sheep. He owns them and he calls them out by name. But notice in verse 4 that he also brings them out and goes before them. He brings them out and he goes before them. Verse 4, and when he brings out his own sheep, 
He goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Interesting that although he calls us by name, and it, it's an effectual call, right? It's, an, it's a, a wonder-working grace. It's a powerful call. It accomplishes that which it's intended to accomplish. And although that's true, although he calls us by name, and it's an intimate, a personal, an individual call, he has to get us out with some force. The word there for brings them out is the word ekbalo. It means he throws us out. He throws us out. He expels us with some force. He has to throw you out of the fold of your sin. How many of you have felt that way coming to the Lord? It's not easy repenting, right? Not easy repenting. Not easy turning from sin. It's a battle. He has to throw you out of the fold of your sin. He has to throw you out of the world. Throw you out of the fold of the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's difficult to turn from this world and to turn from your own flesh. The Bible says you have to agonize to get through the narrow gate, which is difficult. It's a difficult way which leads to life. Now, again, we talk about that, but we have to put that in context, right, of so many that teach today that it's easy all you have to do is say this prayer. All you have to do is this, that, or the other thing. Anytime you hear any call to the gospel prefaced by all you have to do, you need to, verse 5, flee from that stranger. Once you're through, it's not going to be easy either. It's no flowery beds of ease once you're through the gate. Once you're out of the fold. But notice, though, Notice, though, that although he has to throw us out of the fold of our sin, verse 4 says, he goes before us. He goes before us. He doesn't drive you by whip or at the point of a sword. He goes before us lovingly, graciously, but authoritatively, right? Lovingly, graciously, and authoritatively. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd but he is Lord Jesus Christ. And it's for our good. It's because he loves us that he is authoritative. You know, Western shepherds, you have these, these shepherds in the ancient Near East that would go behind the sheep, right? Uh, or that would go in front of the sheep, leading them out. Western shepherds drive the sheep. Often Western, sh Western shepherds drive from behind the sheep and they use dogs or clubs and they drive the sheep. Here you see a biblical picture of how the good shepherd lovingly leads the sheep. I think this is a biblical portrayal of how the Lord leads us. The loving direction of God. Now that loving direction of God compels the sheep to hear and to follow. The sheep with a new heart, they have new spiritual ears through which they can hear the Lord. And they follow in adoration of the shepherd. The love of Christ compels us, right? Compels us. That we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died, right? The good shepherd compels the sheep, leads the sheep, graciously, lovingly, and authoritatively leads out the sheep. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11 says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. That's one way to think about how the good shepherd leads. He brings them out and he goes before them. He doesn't drive them from behind with a whip or a sword or a dog. He leads them. He brings them out. He goes before them. But think about this way. Think about it in another way. Another way in which the good shepherd goes before his sheep. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. We serve an awesome Lord. Amen? Just a glorious and a gloriously good chief shepherd. Hebrews chapter 2. And drop down to verse 14. This is another way in which the good shepherd goes before his sheep. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Inasmuch then... As the children have partaken, that word means, it's koinonia, it means fellowship. They've, um, they share, they have communion together in flesh and blood. 
We're flesh and blood. We have communion together. We partake together in that reality, right? Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Christ, likewise shared in the same. That word there for shared, not the same word. It means that he added to himself something that was originally not a part of his nature. So in this sense, he added to himself our humanity. He came, this is his incarnation, he came, added to his divine nature, humanity. He shared with us in that, do you see? He himself likewise shared in the same, that for the purpose that through death, he might one, destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Praise God. And two, so that he might release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now listen, verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he went before us. You see? In all things, he had to be made like his brethren so that he could go before us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's gone before us in that, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You see, that's glorious truth. Now think about that for a moment. He goes before us. He goes before us that he might become a substitute for us to reconcile men to God, to destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. But he also goes before us so that he can help us when we're tempted. He not only saves us, but he sympathizes with us. Do you see? He goes before us so that he could be a merciful and a faithful high priest on our behalf. Look over at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And look there at verse 14. Now here, the Bible says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. This goodness of the good shepherd, considering what he's done, let us hold fast. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He went before us. Do you see? Let us therefore, in light of all of this, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Wherever you go, right? Whatever sin that you're battling, whatever your circumstance, whatever situation that you find yourself in, he has gone before you. He has experienced temptation. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ has experienced temptation to a far greater degree than you will ever face it. If you think about that, you succumb to temptation far before ever experiencing the full fury of it. The Lord Jesus Christ never succumbed to temptation. He was sinless, without sin. He faced the full measure of every temptation that came upon him because he withstood it to the end. He can sympathize with our weakness. He has felt what we've felt. He knows hunger. He knows thirst. He knows weariness. He knows grief. He knows grief. He knows times of trouble. He knows pain. He knows love. He knows joy. He knows indignation. He knows anger. He knows heartache. He had to exercise faith. He had to exercise faith. He had to walk by the Spirit. He prayed. He trusted God. In all of that, in all the ways in which his humanity he went before us, the Lord Jesus Christ overcame. He was victorious in every trial. Utterly and completely victorious in every battle. 
faithful in every circumstance. So when you find yourself battling sin, there's grace here for help in your time of need. Turn to Christ. Put your faith in Christ. When you're in fearful circumstances and you're facing anxiety or depression or discouragement, turn to Christ. Come boldly into his throne room to find grace. The one who is fully God is the one who is fully man. And he fully understands and he can fully provide help in time of need. He leads us. He leads us having gone before us. Do you see? We serve a great Savior. It's a great picture, isn't it, of the, the master-disciple relationship. He calls us by name. You know, He leads us. He brings us out going before us. It's a beautiful picture of the master-disciple relationship. You know, the Lord commands. The Lord is authoritative. There are commands in Scripture. But if you think about His gracious and merciful office as the great and merciful and faithful high priest, in the way that He leads, how is the Christian to respond to that? It's not, what must I do, right? It's, what can I do? When I'm tempted to wander, when you're tempted to wander off into paths and sin and rebellion against God, laziness and apathy, you can say, no, because I am loved in this way, because of all that he has done, because of what he does even now, I will not wander. I am cared for by the great and good shepherd of the sheep. And I will follow him. It goes before us. So we've, we've looked at the directive or the authoritative love of the good shepherd for his sheep and is leading them and is calling them and is bringing them out and is going before them. But next, I want you to see his directive love in both the following and the knowing of the sheep. Look at verse 4. Now, having heard his voice in verse 3, the sheep follow him, verse 4, for they know his voice. Now, again, the calling and leading of the good shepherd is efficacious. There's grace at work in it, and it produces an effect. It produces an effect. One of the effects is, one, they know his voice, verse 4. They know his voice. His voice. True sheep, true sheep have a discerning ear by the grace of God. They hear his voice, their ears go up, they recognize the voice of the good shepherd, and they follow him. They trust the good shepherd. There's no need uh, to be fearful of being lost. There's no lack of spiritual food. There's no want of security. There's unshakable, unwavering safety in the shepherd. They are never to be abandoned. What he wants you to have, he gives you. What he wants to withhold from you, he withholds. What's not good for you, all things made to work together for your good, they know his voice, they trust him, and so they follow him. Now, a sheep can wander, right? Praise God uh, that the good shepherd pulls back his wandering sheep. There are those that wander from the fold because they were never part of the fold to begin with. But the good shepherd, they trust, they know his voice, and they follow him. Now, that's the result of their good hearing. The result of their good hearing is that they follow him. Here specifically, to follow means to obey, adhere to him, cling to him, cling to his teachings, cling to his word. And that's the mark of a true sheep. Think about the new covenant. The Bible says, God says, that in his covenant, he'll make a new covenant that he will give us a new heart. He'll take out that heart of stone, give us a heart of flesh. He will indwell us with his spirit and what? He'll cause us, that's right. He'll cause us to walk according to his judgments. So ask yourself this morning, are you following the good shepherd? Do you want to? If you want to, then follow him. Follow him. He is the good 
shepherd. But the good shepherd doesn't leave you where you are. He throws you out of the fold of your sin. Do you see? He leads you and he expects you to follow. You are expected to follow him. All this is just significant theology. You have God's sovereignty. He leads. He brings out. He's the one who calls. You have man's responsibility that is equally and fully true. You must hear him and respond. You must follow him, obey him. There's foreknowledge here. There's predestination. There's election. There's the effectual call of God. There's irresistible grace. It's like just full of theology. The directive, the authoritative love of the good shepherd for his sheep is seen in the knowing of his voice and in the following of the sheep. This just points us to another profound truth in verses 5 through 8. So we consider the good shepherd's love for his sheep. He shepherds his people with a protective love. He shepherds them with a directive or an authoritative love. But next, he shepherds his people with an exclusive love. An exclusive love. Look at verse 5, back in John chapter 10. Verse 5. Here John says, Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. In verse 5, where he says, no means, by no means, that's ume. It means absolutely not. not. It's, a, it's a strong negation in the Greek. With the same certainty that they follow the shepherd, they certainly will not follow a stranger. Right? Stranger here is someone belonging to another. Someone who doesn't belong in the environment in which they find themselves. They are a stranger to the fold. Now, true sheep... Genuine sheep may, from time to time, be temporarily corralled by someone who is deceptive. You've seen that happen. That may have happened to you. Even though they may be temporary, temporarily corralled, they're never going to be truly fed. They're not going to be nourished. Their growth is going to be stunted, and they're going to be restless. They're going to be needy. They're going to be unsettled increasingly, they're going to say that voice that I'm hearing is not a voice that I'm comfortable with. It's not the voice of the good shepherd. It's not familiar to me. And when the truth comes along, they recognize his voice. The spirit witnesses with their spirit. And they say, amen. And they flee never to go back to that stranger. That's the way that it works. They won't stay long in error although occasionally being temporarily corralled by a deceptive liar. Many of you are here today. Many of you are here because God saw to it that you heard truth, that you heard his voice. Amen? You can point back to your experience, to the Lord leading you out, going before you, bringing you out, throwing you out of the fold. You heard truth. A truth is exclusively from him exclusively from him. And we are to follow no one else but him. His love is an exclusive love. Yeah, but what about those, those Muslims? So they worship Allah. That's the same. We're talking about the same God. No. No. If you embrace Allah in Islam, you go to hell when you die. The true sheep hear his voice and they follow him. It is an exclusive love. What about, you know, Mormonism? They talk about Jesus Christ. They use sort of the Bible. <laughs> no. True sheep hear his voice. They follow no one else. They don't follow Joseph Smith. They follow no one else. They don't follow Ellen G. White. They don't follow Joel Osteen. They don't follow Joyce Myers. They don't follow Creflo Dollar. They don't follow strangers. They follow the shepherd, the good shepherd of the sheep. We are to follow no one else but him. There is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave his life for the sheep, a ransom for all to be testified in due time. For those who are not his sheep, for those who are not his sheep, they'll fall for anything. They will fall for anything. And you see that throughout professed Christianity today. Those who are not of his sheep will fall for anything. And it is sometimes staggering what they'll fall for. You, know, you listen to some, one of these liars, one of these false teachers, make a statement and you're like, man, there's, just, there's, there's no way, right? No way that anybody's going to fall for that. And then there's the stadium full of people there the next week. It's, a, it's amazing. 
It's interesting, those who are not his sheep, they'll fall for anything. And the one of voice that they will not hear is his voice. <laughs> the voice of the good shepherd. That case in point is in verse 6. Look at verse 6. Jesus used this illustration, but what? They didn't understand the things he was, he was talking about. <laughs> they didn't hear his voice. He used this illustration, this paroimia, this uh, picture but those that were not his sheep couldn't understand. They couldn't hear his voice. They, they didn't know what he was talking about. It's a case in point. Good example here in verse 6. We know from our immediate context here that there are two truths that characterize this lack of understanding, this lack of hearing. One, they cannot understand. They cannot understand. And two, they will not understand. Both are true. They cannot understand and they will not understand. They cannot understand 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. As for the willing, as for those who are willing, God says, and you will seek me and find me, when you search for me with all your heart. Are you willing? Do you want to hear his voice? Do you want to find? You are a fool if you don't. Do you want to hear his voice? Do you want to follow the good shepherd? Do you want to go to heaven when you die? Do you want to be with him in eternity, praising and worshiping him? Then follow him. Search for him. You will seek me, God says, and you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. If you want heaven, if you want Christ, then search with all your heart. God says you will find him. Well, I prayed that one time for two minutes and I got nothing. <laughs> keep praying. Cry out to God and keep crying out to God. Keep staying faithful. Keep coming. Don't let the flesh keep you back. Don't let the world, don't let the devil stand between you and God, between you and eternity, between you and the eternal well-being of your soul. Don't let anything get in your way. Follow the good shepherd. Cling to him. Hear him. Seek out his voice. You have it right here. Search for him and you'll find him, God says. Pray, cry out to him. His is an exclusive love. You find peace nowhere else. You'll find joy nowhere. They're te temporary, right? Temporary passing moments of peace, passing pleasures, passing joys. That's all that sin is. It is temporary and fleeting. But there is no eternal joy. There is no eternal peace. The way of the transgressor is hard and it only gets harder. Follow the Lord. Look at what a good shepherd he is. Look at all that he has done for the sheep. He's given his life for them. He has done everything. You have all things that pertain to godliness in him. All things that pertain to life in this world and life in the next. Follow the good shepherd. How gracious how merciful, how compassionate, and you in your sin and in your rebellion against him. Will you continue to just thumb your nose at his grace, at his compassion, at his kindness? What are you doing? Will you continue to just live in apathy and indifference? What are you doing? Will you continue to neglect his word, neglect him? He is the good shepherd that shepherds your soul. Follow him. Hear his voice. Don't you have pity on your own soul? I have pity on you this morning. If you're here today and you're a part of that fold, if you're one of his sheep, don't you have pity on them? Christ had pity on them. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, the Lord was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Got to preach him to lost people. 
you know, the, the rest of that Isaac Watts hymn, how sweet and awful is the place. Awful meaning full of awe, not terrible. Isaac Watts writes, pity the nations, O our God, constrain the earth to come. Send thy victorious word abroad and bring the strangers home. We long to see thy churches full, that all the chosen race may with one voice and heart and soul sing thy redeeming grace. Will you follow him this morning? Christian, if you're struggling, if you're wandering, if you're imperiled in the battle, cry out to the good shepherd who gives grace in time of need and stand fast in him. I love Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we turn anew, turn afresh to look upon the, the face of our good shepherd through your word, through the understanding that your spirit graciously gives to us, and we praise you and we worship you and we thank you, God. I pray, Lord, that in your goodness and compassion toward the sheep, that you would make us complete. Make us complete in every good work. Cause us by your Spirit to do your will and work in us what is well-pleasing in your sight for your honor, for your praise, for your glory. Do that in our Good Shepherd, in Jesus Christ. May we be found in him not having any spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing. For those here not saved, God, I pray you would throw them out of the fold of this world, their flesh and the devil, and that you, Lord, would release them who have, through fear of death, all their lifetime been subject to bondage, and that for your good name, for your glory, you would save them to worship and to praise you with the saints for all eternity. Lord, it's, it's, it's difficult. And you know that it is because you went before us. And so we pray to you, Lord Jesus Christ, come quickly. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.